I am here today with Nora Hartlaub, um, who is an interdisciplinary artist living in Asheville. Um, I want to talk about some of your projects, but before we get into that, could you just give us a, a brief overview of your life, where you grew up, where you went to school? My undergrad is from the Cleveland Institute of Art in Fiber and Material Studies. And my master's is from Western Carolina University, which is an interdisciplinary program. And so um, I have always been interested in understanding how materials relate meaning to us in the world. Awesome. How did you end up in Asheville currently? Um, I had moved from Cleveland, Ohio to Ocracoke Island, North Carolina, which was like crazy culture shock. And I was there for some years. And then I applied and attended a special session called Craft and Social Conscience at Penland School of Crafts and just totally fell in love with this area. And by the end of the summer, I had figured out how to like fit all of my belongings, my two dogs and a roommate in the back of my truck, not the roommate, he rode with me. And we drove to Asheville and drove around and found a place to live and had a house within like 24 hours. It was pretty wild. I want to talk, I know we want to look at your art, but also I, I want to talk a little bit about your studio space. Um, are you in your studio right now? I'm not. I'm actually in our dining room because okay. I wanted to make sure we had good internet for this. Yeah. <laughs> You have like an outbuilding that you work in? I do. I have a 10 by 16 shed that mm. has electricity and a kerosene heater and I take jugs of water down there and make it work. This was a work called the, in, or is a work called the insurmountable thing. And this was part of the North Carolina Artists Exhibition at CAM in Raleigh in 2020. And um, this work is a video performance and audio piece that was really inspired by a material as many of my works are. At the time I was a tour guide for like an ecotourism company. And so every time it was maybe gonna rain, they would hand out plastic ponchos. And by the end of the season, I had amassed just thousands of these things. And I had really been contemplating the impacts of tourism and um, economics on this fragile barrier island region, creating a work that really sort of encompassed that idea of the Sisyphean struggle became the inspiration for this work. Can you remind us of the Sisyphean? Yes, the Sisyphean myth. So this is um, Sisyphus. He got in trouble for something. And basically what happened is he had to continually roll a boulder up a hill just to have it fall back down again. It. So it's this representation of futility. And so um, a performer, Marcel Siqueira Ramirez, uh, was who rolled this boulder through Jockey's Ridge State Park and then rolls back down and has continued to be like rolled around as this group of people witness and mourn this event. Because you talk a lot about how your materials kind of lead you to where you want to go. Is that also, was that part of it as well? Like looking at this heap of ponchos maybe? Yeah, and I mean like really like uh, thousands of them. And it was also really interesting to be processing them because as you are collecting them, you know, they're getting like bunched into like these boxes or bags. And then you get them into the studio and you start to unpack them and the smell of humanity <laughs> that came off of these things was also really intense. And so for some weeks, they were just all sort of like on lines in our backyard. I think our neighbors just thought I was bananas. Living with that material and feeling the effects of all of those people through their smell, it really did start to just feel kind of like a ball of worms to me too. Like the, like this problematic interweaving of all these different aspects having to do with climate crisis. And also something that I do often when I'm trying to figure out what a material is trying to tell me is I play 20 questions with myself. And just in asking the question, I often get a lot of information out of that process. What's an example? Of um, okay, so like here was a question that I had about the ponchos 
having to do with inequity and inequality because of the fact that in order to be a tourist, you have to have a certain amount of funding, right? And then to buy a ticket to go on my tour was pretty expensive as well. And so thinking about this disposable sort of ephemeral material having really concrete impacts having to do with economics and reflective of our greater social structure. Why did I interpret that as you ask the objects the question? Because I think it's kind of, that's a good point, Ursula, because I think it's sort of a little bit bold. I'm trying to sort of distill out the most concrete meanings from a material. You know, I had already been sort of contemplating climate crisis um, prior to this next project, but then the pandemic happened. <laughs> and um, we went into lockdown and um, my summer job was no more and I was teaching online. And um, I also was working on a small farm um, at the southern end of Manio, which is called Wanchi's. Wanchi's is a really special place to me. I really love it there, I truly do, but it is not my people. I would go each morning to care for horses and in the little barn that I was in had been this old hay stall, I think at some point, but it just was like full of cobwebs and there was nothing in there. And I was like, oh, this is a space to do something in, you know, like, um, because I think of space as a material as well. Each time I stepped into that space with a material, I allowed myself to just do whatever kind of was going to happen within 20 minutes, because that's how long the camera can record for, right? So these became a series of sculptures that were created by my own body and in response to that material in that moment, in that space, on that day. Reading about this on your website, one of the things that really struck me is how you talked about how you would bring your materials into the space, like in secrecy, uh, just because you didn't want to, you wanted to avoid the questions that come up. <laughs> yeah. And I found that really interesting, just this idea of like, making your work in secret and in private. Um, I, I definitely relate to that. How much of that played into this also? I mean, a lot, because especially where I was at that, you know, at that point, um, I, a lot of the conversations that were happening in the community that I was in during that time period were speaking of the pandemic as though it were a hoax. Being able to do this work really relied on being able to be private and secretive about it. I think I would have lost my place at that farm had people known what was going on in there. It's so benign. It's not even like a dangerous, but I, I can totally see how someone would look at this and be like, this is weird. This woman is weird. Yeah, and just that would be really threatening. And I really value those relationships that I have with those folks. Even to this day, there's people that I keep in touch with. All right, so then we moved back to Asheville and I was walking around with my dog and I was seeing all this trash everywhere. <laughs> And I started to notice these really sort of interesting correlations between how trash collects in the city and how trash collects on the beach um, due to currents, traffic, human movement, whatnot. And so this became um, this work called Oops, You Dropped It, which is a 50 cent vending machine where you can purchase like little compositions of trash that I have uh, made. Like it is just like a random like a vending machine that has like kind of moved through my neighborhood and I need to go check on it because I think it's about to move again. After again moving back to Asheville, I went back to another job working for a horse farm in Candler, uh, North Carolina. And in August of last year, we got hit with a absolutely crazy devastating flash flood. Like a six foot wall of water hit the barn. I don't know how all the horses survived. It was absolutely traumatic and crazy. So I have been collecting um, debris from the farm, which also interestingly collects in the same way that it does in the city and on the beach. And uh, in setting these into cast plaster uh, HO scale shipping containers, which are like, you know, like the model train style HO shipping containers. And I'm working on casting 1,382 of these as that is the amount of shipping containers estimated that fall into the sea annually. Again, thinking about like mass consumerism, pandemic supply chain interruptions, um, 
and the increase in the amount of containers that are falling into the ocean because of that increase in ordering online. And also because of that increase, um, ship captains normally would avoid weather systems and or in order to avoid what is called stack collapse, which is when you know you have like this crazy thing happen and containers just fly off. Um, but because of the demand and also because of increased uh, storms out on the ocean, they are now having to just kind of like barrel through this stuff. And so now even more of these are estimated to be getting lost. So with the these items that are embedded in the pieces are things you took out of the mud, right? From the from the flood. And what is that process like? Like like extracting and unearthing these things that have collected in the, the it's like world. being a weird archaeologist. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like it's like and it's 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 so wild the amount of plastics that I found that are easily dated from the 1980s or earlier. Um, and just to think that all that stuff was upriver, just hanging out, like who knows where. I know in this area too, like people buried, they were told to bury their appliances in the banks of the river. Like, oh yeah, there's an old car in the bank of the river on the back of the farm that like, yeah. You know, like, it's like a 50s car, like it's been there forever. I also want to quickly ask you, like, how do you divide up your time as a working artist? I know you also have a job working at the horse farm. When do you find time to work? How does the time management as an artist work for you? I, you know, that's a good question. I think um, just recently I had like a total blowout night and I stayed in my studio till like two in the morning. Like that's one of the things that can be really challenging because um, the reason I think I had that, like just I had to stay and work for hours and hours and hours was because I had spent so much time in the previous weeks applying for like grants and exhibitions. And that's the not fun part of being an artist. <laughs> that's the um, whole, yeah, there's, that's such a big chunk of it. Yeah, and so like trying to figure out how to balance those things can definitely be challenging, but you just have to set time aside. It does seem like time is also a material here. Like like you said, the studio, the space, and time is such a big thing too, and how much time we can put towards a project. Yeah, it's that, that idea of something being labor intensive has always been a part of my work, and I think that is... Um, probably part of having that background in materials and fiber study and like learning how to weave at a pretty young age and knowing that you're going to be sort of like clicking away at this thing, clicking away at this thing. And then at some point you're going to get to pull it all off the loom and see what you've been working on. But having to have sort of that experience of like slowly building something over time, I think is part of just my process. And it's something I've kind of had to get okay with. Piece that I'm working on now, like I have a goal of like, I have to cast at least eight of these a day because wow. they're time intensive. It's like, it's there's a lot, you know, in collecting the materials and then like figuring out how they're going to be composed prior to like pouring the plaster. I just know that it's going to take me months and months to get this thing done, but it's okay because it's going to be awesome when it's finished. It's so awesome. I can't wait to see it. You're on Instagram, right? Uh-huh. It... Nora Hartlab underscore art is my handle. And your website is norahartlaub.com, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Well, we will be keeping an eye out for final installation of this project. It's Super exciting. Thank you, Ursula. <laughs> Thanks, Nora.